Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Wound Biofilm, the Evolving Science and Clinical Management. I am Bob Woodard, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by labroots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals and sponsored by Roche Diagnostics. As a global leader in healthcare, Roche Diagnostics offers a broad portfolio of tools that help healthcare providers in the early detection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. In molecular diagnostics, Roche is driven by a vision of working with laboratories like yours to improve the medical value you offer in microbiology, infectious disease, oncology, and genomics. Roche continues to meet unmet needs through investment in research, innovation, and scientific excellence with the goal of supporting your important role in improving patients' lives. To learn more about Roche Diagnostics, please visit usdiagnostics.roche.com. Thank you. Before we begin today's presentation, I have a few announcements to make. First of all, this is an interactive event, and you are strongly encouraged to submit questions and comments during the presentation. To do so, click on the green presentation button, I mean clean, green Q&A button in the lower left of your presentation window, <clears throat> and enter your comment or question in the green in the Q&A box that appears on the screen. Next, the presentation slides will appear in the slide window. You can enlarge the slides by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right of the slide window. And finally, if you experience any technical difficulties with seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button in the upper right of the presentation window, or let us know what's happening using the Q&A button in the lower left, and we'll resolve the issue as quickly as possible. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Randall Wolcott. Dr. Wolcott is the founder of the Southwest Regional Wound Care Center in Lubbock, Texas. The Wound Care Center specializes in biofilm-based wound care. The Wound Care Center offers state-of-the-art technology with molecular diagnostics and state-of-the-art alternative medicine, including customized wound gel, topical wound gels. Dr. Wolcott is passionate about healing wounds. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolcott to today's presentation. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Bob. Uh, th this is a, a brand new format for me, and so, uh, you know, we'll just go with it. The thing I worry about is we might not be able to connect as well. So if you guys have questions, you know, put them out there and, and we'll try to answer them as we go. Uh, this is about wound biofilm. My first thing I have to tell you is I do have a little conflict of interest. I'm a, a part equity owner in a molecular laboratory that utilizes roach uh, technology. And uh, what we decided is that even though we can identify the bacteria that uh, we see in wounds and we can identify a different microbial reality than we've ever had before, and that's the quote that you see up there by Erasmus, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Well, what we realized real quick, we were seeing these bacteria, we were understanding that there were new species and different uh, groups of bacteria than we'd ever seen before. But what we realized was more importantly is what we perceive or how we organize that information. And, and that's what I was talking about connecting with you. I'd like to see if, if, if my arguments are, are penetrating, if, if, they're, or if they're taking hold, and I, I won't be able to do that today. But when you look at this and you see two faces, okay, that's a data set. That's just, just pixels on your screen. And you see an image of two faces. But then if we, if we come at this a different direction, you can see a candlestick. It's the same data set. We organize it differently in our brain and we come to two different conclusions. And that leads us to the elephant in the room, which is biofilm. It's neglected in medical textbooks. It's neglected in medical microbiology uh, and definitely neglected in clinical medicine. And I think you're going to see that we can lay a very good uh, foundation uh, from the literature that biofilm is not only real, because I get that question all the time, 
but the biofilm is an important, a very important driver uh, in healthcare today. So whether this is a four-legged elephant or a six-legged elephant, it is the elephant in the room. So the best place to start is what is a biofilm? And uh, way back in 19, uh, oh, it was back in the 1970s, uh, Kosterton had a Scientific American article, How Bacteria Stick, and that's the first mention of this community behavior of bacteria. Uh, the, the, there's other vague mentions, but that's the first organized and credited uh, mention of biofilm. Uh, Kosterton was invited by Scientific American, uh, and this is a 19, uh, 1999 article, just to review article and its importance in medicine, but I, this shows you the timeline of biofilm. You have uh, uh, the ability for biofilm to uh, stick, or excuse me, for planktonic bacteria to come in, let's use an arrow on that, uh, to come in and, and actually attached to a surface. Attachment is a very strong molecular signal for that bacteria to upregulate biofilm suites of genes within its genome. And so very quickly, and we're talking five minutes or less, uh, it, uh, it uh, puts out, it secretes extracellular polymeric substances, and that's things like sh polymeric sugars, uh, proteins, uh, uh, extracellular DNA, and it can incorporate uh, uh, molecules from the uh, uh, from the environment, and it'll form this microcolony that you see here. So once and the cells are dividing, they're still active. So in a microcolony, you have the biofilm switching over to biofilm, uh, uh, the phenotype switching over to biofilm, and then. Uh, uh, after a quorum or a, a certain number of cells, a cell density is reached and a certain number of molecules are put out into that matrix, that signal is strong enough to cause biofilm to uh, uh, take on a three-dimensional shape. So there's a heterogeneity or a, a difference in the phenotypic expression of the genes in the uh, top part uh, of the uh, biofilm as well as in the mid part and the bottom of the biofilm. So there's a lot of science that goes in that. There's thousands of articles every year that, that, uh, that, that are produced on, on the molecular level of what's happening here. But in this, we're taking a real high level view right now at, at, this, at this slide. And basically what we're saying is, is that the, the, back, that the uh, formation of a mature biofilm requires uh, uh, a lot of differentiation, a lot of cooperation between not only individual species, but inter-species. So uh, we have to, uh, we have, uh, say, gram-negatives, gram-positives. We, we have different uh, groups of bacteria that have to cooperate with one another. That seems to be organized by the quorum sensing systems that are, that are present in the biofilm. And at the end of its, uh, once it reaches the climax community and, and it, through its quorum sensing mechanisms, it decides it's not going to get any bigger, then it starts seeding back or propagating into the environment. About 70% of, of its uh, seeding back into the environment is in packets, and those packets are important clinically. And then the other 30% is planktonic bacteria. So these are these cells actually develop the flagella and, and all the, the the genetic expression or the phenotype of planktonic bacteria, and they're they're released out into the environment. So that's biofilm in a nutshell, and it's it's very important. And we're going to take those concepts and see if we can. Uh, and here are some of Kosterton's ideas on how we could manage each one of these steps medically. And we'll try to weave some of those together at the end of the uh, of the presentation. So that's biofilm. It is real. It's well accepted. It's vetted in the community. Uh, not even. I, I'm going to guess three months ago at a WOCN, I was attending a lecture, and this uh, top uh, illustration was used to identify what's happening in the wound bed with bacteria. This is how wounds organize. 
uh, their the, the microbes in a wound to organize. And the fact is, it's not true. I mean, if you look in with electron microscope, if you look in with confocal or any other imaging technology, you're not going to see these fuzzy balls. You're not going to see individual planktonic bacteria residing on the surface as contamination or maybe propagating a little bit and climbing up on each other but not invading the surface or even becoming critically colonized. You, you, you really don't see that kind of behavior. Uh, what you see is more what's in the bottom depiction we have here. Uh, this was done by Peg Dirks at uh, CBE. And basically, the bacteria attach, just like the last uh, uh, slide we showed, it'll form the microcolony quickly. What causes, what's the trigger for that attachment and microcolony formation? We still don't know. That's a good area of research. But it, it seems like bacteria are, are much more successful if they uh, are in a biofilm phenotype, and we'll talk about that in a second, than if they're in a planktonic bacteria uh, or phenotype inside a host environment because there's host immunity. The defenses are necessary. The defenses are only found in the biofilm phenotype. So once that microcolony forms, and it'll form if uh, white blood cells, antibiotics, uh, or antibodies, or complement, if, if those things aren't present, then, then that can attach. And if uh, the host immunity is slow, then quorum sensing can take place. It places bacteria deep into the tissue, three, four millimeters in a mouse model. Uh, it'll rise up off the surface again, three, four, five millimeters uh, with uh, uh, impregnated with host uh, materials. And so this is what we see microscopically. This, this uh, like I'm saying, you can organize this, this data in, in different ways. And it looks like if we organize around biofilm, we're going to explain what we see on the wound bed a lot better. So uh, let's just talk about, is it biofilm? Uh, every uh, uh, wound care provider that I've talked to, every scientist that works with the microbiology of wounds agrees there's bacteria in a wound. So there's only three things that bacteria can be doing. It can be doing something to help us, like a commensal. And the point uh, of this uh, slide, it, it doesn't illustrate it well, is, is that there are commensal systems for every bacteria. Corinibacterium has its commensal system. Uh, Staph epidermis has its commensal system. Uh, Propionobacterium, and you, it, the commensals that are on our skin that cause us no harm, that keep us free of certain pathogens, have clear crosstalk between certain cells with certain cytokines and, and other uh, chemical uh, mediators. So those commensal systems only exist in the dermis. They're, they're predicated on the cell lines and, and the, the, the immune cells that are in that host environment. When you break through the skin, when you're in subcutaneous tissue or fat uh, or uh, muscle or tendon, those commensal systems don't exist. Therefore, uh, there really can't be a commensal of the wound. Well, how about contaminants? We all know what contaminants are. And like this little guy right here, uh, you know, he's not hurting anybody. He's not dividing. He's, you know, he, he came in from the environment and he's just residing on the wound. He's transient. That's what we consider a contaminant. It's not attached and it's not doing any harm. And that's, that can happen in, in wounds. This is an acute wound, and that's basically when we looked at 16 different acute wounds with different technologies, this is mainly what we see. But the, the hallmark of this is, is very low numbers of bacteria. If we, if we biopsy this wound and we look for bacteria, we're looking at 10 to the second, 10 to the third numbers. We're not looking at 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the ninth uh, per five millimeter biopsy. So uh, acute wounds tend to have what we, you would consider a contaminant. And then bacteria could do a negative thing. And that could possibly be like this. Now, this is from a diabetic foot ulcer. And it's one of the wounds that we included in our publication in 2008. And basically, I, I just want you to look at it. These are cocci. Uh, these up here are cocci. Uh, these are rods. And then you've got different sizes, different shapes. And so uh, this is truly polymicrobial. Now here, 
this is host extracellular matrix. This is host extracellular matrix, just like uh, what you're seeing up here. And it's collagen. So this is only about 10 to 15 microns thick. Biofilm does not have to be thick, but these web, this web material that you see sticking it onto the surface of the wound, that's host material. That's fibrinogen that's been, uh, that's been polymerized to fibrin. Uh, and, and it also uh, helps the bacteria stick to the surface. So this is a biofilm by anybody's definition. And the question then becomes, can that, does that cause infection? Well, yeah, it does. I mean, the quick answer, and this is Caution Stewart Science article from 99, this, there were other people that talked about biofilm infection, but this put it in a pictorial form and, and really uh, fleshed it out for me anyway. And basically, there, it's showing just exactly what we talked about earlier. Bacteria find a host environment, a breach in the epithelium or in the skin or whatever. In this case, they were talking about cystic fibrosis, but this works for all chronic infection, for all biofilm infections. So the bacteria, if there's any antibodies around, it'll kill it. If there's any antibodies, they'll neutralize it, complement the white blood cells. But if host immunity is slow, the microcolony forms, you see the, the phenotypic shift from the white planktonic to the black uh, biofilm. And I can't stress that enough. The, the, this is one third of the genetic material of, of the bacterium. Uh, it, changes uh, in that in that radical think of it as a caterpillar to a butterfly so it's quite different different antibiotic spectrums different properties uh, then uh, in c uh, the there's quorum sensing it rises up off the surface uh, now the the climax community is resistant to antibodies and and uh, antibiotics and and white blood cells but now the bacteria has a problem okay if it were to attack the tissue and digest the tissue like a like an acute infection like a planktonic bacteria does it loses its foothold it loses its attachment to the host environment so that's that, that's not effective so what it does is it causes hyperinflammation through pro-inflammatory cytokines whatever calls in white blood cells, these phagocytic enzymes are MMPs 2, 8, and 9. And what you've got is a, is a, a inflamed area uh, of the host, which is the hallmark of all chronic infections, is its persistent inflammation. And uh, the uh, inflammation produces uh, the, the uh, capillaries to become leaky. That's a property of inflammation. The mechanisms are worked out and plasma leaks out and that plasma is a, a continual nutrient source for the biofilm. So I want you to think of biofilm infections more like a parasitic infection that can sit there and propagate and release 10, 20, 30% of its mass out into the environment continually day after day versus an acute infection, which is more predatory, which is, you know, either the host kills it or it kills the host. It, it, it's not as successful in the long term as a biofilm infection. So th that model has been worked out for almost 15 years, 16 years now. So uh, to put this in, in perspective in the wound care community, uh, Gardner, uh, just two years after that, unknowing of biofilm or any of those principles, said, let's see what sets a chronic wound apart. Uh, chronic wounds, the, the wound care provider feels like it's infected, but it, you know, it, maybe it doesn't have the, the redness or the tenderness or the heat or, 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 or the, the signs of Celsius like we think of wound uh, infections. However, what we do see is there's significant serous exudate. Well, that's that plasma we talked about the leaking up through the biofilm to nourish it. There's discoloration of the tissue. There's yellow and black and brown. It's, it's not always the red granular uh, color that you would think of a healing wound. There's friable tissue, and that just means dysfunctional. So it, it doesn't have the right tensile strength or the blood vessels are aberrant. And, you know, why would host healing create those aberrancies unless host healing is usurped by uh, different uh, molecules that interrupt that host healing cascade? And we'll talk about that in a second. Pocketing of tissue uh, is just the bacteria eroding down into a surface, and that's a property of biofilm. 
odor uh, human cells don't produce any volatile molecules so the odor must be coming from bacteria and then the big one uh, that's that uh, most people accept and quote and don't think anything about is failure to progress okay the wound is stalled it doesn't heal right it's quote chronic well the definition of a chronic wound is failure to progress so all of a sudden we have the same definition for bowel film or for secondary signs of infection is the same thing for uh, 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 non-healing wound or a chronic wound. The point I'd make with this slide is, is that people, when I tell people that chronic wounds are infected, uh, they, uh, that's not well accepted uh, around the uh, wound care community and yet it is a very definition of infection by a very respected article that's quoted often in the literature. We just haven't connected the dots on that one. So I want you, I want you to, to understand that, that, it, that even the, the, the non-biofilm literature is suggesting that if a wound is, is chronic, is failing to progress, that it is uh, a sign of a secondary sign of infection at least okay that uh, when i start talking about acute and chronic infections in the wound care community i always get questions about acute and chronic wounds and that that's two totally different things we were talking about the chronic wound the chronic wound has this yellowish material over the top of it and it has the exudate you see the white there uh, so, you know, that is a chronic wound. Uh, this is a patient, her name was Chris. She came in on 826 of 05, and, and I love this story uh, because it, my technicians taught me the difference between acute and a chronic wound. So all of a sudden I'm walking past this room and here's this lady crying, she's weeping, she's sobbing. And what had happened was she'd come in to us, she'd had this wound for almost a year, she's in her late 30s, it's a venous leg ulcer. And, uh, you know, she said, you know, you're our last hope. You know, it, it, you're my last hope. I've been through everything. So we did all our anti-biofilm stuff. We were just getting into it in 2004, 2005. We, we did all the standard wound care stuff. We wrapped it and stuff. And lo and behold, three days later on the 29th, we have doubled the size of the wound. And that's why she's sobbing. It's like, oh no, my wound's bigger. Before I could ever talk to this this young lady, uh, my technician who couldn't see me, he was he was facing her, said, "Hey, Chris, Chris, don't worry about this. Okay, this this red wound, this new wound, that's going to heal in a couple weeks. Okay, we see that all the time. That that's caused by the dressings. Your chronic wound's doing well, and I'm looking at that and I'm going, Dan, how do you know that that's got? I mean, where where are you getting this stuff? And lo and behold, two weeks later. Uh, I left this slide in. It, it, it was almost healed. It's still through the skin. Three weeks later, it's completely healed and the chronic wound is there. Now, why is that? Okay. Her, her venous insufficiency is the same where that other wound was. And you saw how deep it was. It, it was deep. It was down in subcutaneous tissue. Uh, you know, it hadn't been there as long, but her, her host factors were all the same. And yet one wound heals up in two weeks and the other one takes two months. What is the difference? Well, acute wounds don't have biofilm, and we, we demonstrated that in that article in 2008, and chronic wounds do have biofilm. Biofilm may be the reason why wounds don't heal, and we're going to show you some more molecular evidence of that. This, I just, I had to throw in at the last minute. I just found it uh, about a month ago, and uh, so the question we, that, that I posed to you is, is can biofilm cause uh, chronic, uh, chronic infections or can biofilm cause a, an infection? And what we find is that, that the European Society for Infectious Disease, very notable, you know, these are people I've, I've referenced, I've talked to, I've spoke with, and, and I mean, they're, they're the movers and shakers in infectious disease and specifically in chronic infectious disease, like chronic infections. And what they say is, in their, in their abstract, is bowel films cause chronic infections. So really, the, the science, I mean, the, the debate is over. I mean, the, 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 the renowned scientists, the best clinicians, the people that look at this stuff say, when you have a chronic infection, something that behaves like a chronic infection, 
biofilm is is the predicate cause for that. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the talk. So I, I gave you the punchline up front, but th you know this is this is you know just trying to add more uh, emphasis from the literature. Uh, Patel and Depozo, out of Mayo Clinic, uh, back in 2007, are, are who I credit for my epiphany in this area of medical biofilm. And basically, we, we classify cancer by the, the term cancer. So, you know, melanoma and sarcoma are radically different. They're treated different. They're diagnosed different. But they're cells outside of host control that grow uncontrollably, and so therefore we call them cancers. If we put all medical biofilms into a category, which is what uh, Dr. Patel was doing in her talk, uh, it, it's amazing. Okay, so, and the, the thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that every discipline deals with chronic infection. So whether you're ENT or pulmonary, whether, you know, what, whatever you're dealing with, you're dealing with, your specialty will have a chronic effect, infection associated with it. And all these different disciplines, independent of each other, came to the same way to treat these infections. Basically ignore them, treat them episodically with antibiotics when they flare up and the patient complains enough. After a year or two years or 10 years, when the structure that the bowel film is attached to is degraded enough, then you strip the sinuses or you transplant the lungs or you remove the metal or you take out the catheter or you take out the stones, you replace the heart valve and for wounds, we cut off the leg. Yeah, so we cut off body parts. And I'm not here to condemn how we treat this stuff. I'm just saying that, that as we learn this stuff, as you apply your knowledge base to your area of expertise, when you can manage biofilm uh, adequately, maybe you can stop cutting off body parts. Maybe the, the way to treat this is to cure the infection instead of cut off body parts. And that's what we're looking for. All right, so I want to move down into the molecular level on this slide. We've already, we just looked at biofilm is real, biofilm can cause infections, and now we're going to get into some of the molecular tools that it uses for those infections. Then we'll look at diagnosis, then we'll look at treatment very rapidly. Okay, the, the thing that gives the community its power, that gives it its definition, that gives it its colony defenses is the extracellular polymeric substance. Uh, I was just, I just got back from Japan yesterday. I, we gave multiple talks while we were there and they are very strong in the use of macrolides. Uh, they use uh, uh, clarithromycin, they also use erythromycin. Uh, and they, they do that with almost all their chronic infections and they do that uh, not as the antibiotic treating the bacterial cells, but they see that as a way to, to break down, impair, punch holes, whatever you want to call it, degrade the extracellular matrix and make their other treating agents more successful. Uh, a lot of this research came out of the University of Toko, that's Ashida, Kim, people like that. Uh, so they have very strong molecular group, uh, Marisaco, there's lots of names there, uh, lots of uh, good imaging, lots of good molecular work being done uh, by the groups over there. So extracellular polymeric substance, very important. The next thing is synergies. Uh, we could not have beef uh, without the synergies in the different stomachs of the cow. This is the uh, rumen uh, from some stomach, and I don't know what the bacteria are, but the byproducts of the green are basically used, the breakdown products are used by the red bacteria. So you get, I want you to see some things. The, the bacteria stay uh, in groups. They're, they're swirled like Neapolitan ice cream. And it's not a homogenous mixture of the different bacteria. Uh, the other thing is, is the, the byproducts of, the, there's a metabolic cooperation or synergy between uh, uh, bacterial biofilms uh, that's critical and it's an important and it's a relatively unexplored area of chronic infections is how the bacteria help one another. 
uh, low abundance bacteria. So uh, in dental plaques, if you have lots of strep mutans, so say the green is strep mutans and you throw in just a little bit of Porphyromonas gingivalis, it changes the biofilm from being a, a, bio, a, a neutral biofilm that doesn't cause disease to one that causes disease. So it causes dysbiosis in that, that biofilm in a, a, a mouse model. So basically, you're, we're talking about bacteria that are 1,000 times less abundant than, than the rest of the bacteria, uh, the rest of the biofilm, uh, can still change the biofilm from being a, uh, you know, a, a, something that the host tolerates to something that causes disease in the host. The point there is, is you don't know what bacteria matter when you look at a group of bacteria, and people say, well, then how are you ever going to treat it? And we'll talk about those principles in a second. Then finally, there's senescence, and there's a type 3 secretory system, type 4 secretory system, type 6, and each one of these secretory systems, like uh, there's about 60 different effector proteins for uh, uh, Pseudomonas alone. Yersinia has a, a about 30, 35 different effector proteins. So if you look at this model over here, that is a cell, that's a human cell, and then the little black dots that you see, that's Yersinia bacteria. If the Yersinia is able to inject a small protein called the OSPC3, uh, it, and it's about 50 amino acids, it's a small little peptide, it will go in and it will block the apoptotic pathways, mainly the caspase system, and it will prevent this cell from dying. So bacteria to be successful, to quote, in Kim's word, colonize, and in, in my terminology, cause biofilm, they must inject uh, these small proteins into the cell. So this one protein will keep this bacteria from apoptosing. Another small molecule will reorganize the cytoskeleton. Another small molecule will block cell uh, division. And, and then another one will block manufacturing. So senescence is just meaning that the whole cell is dysfunctional. Well, in the wound care community, we always thought that, that the reason that, that the wound bed cells were senescent or dysfunctional was because of oxidative stress or because of proteolysis, proteolysis from the MMPs. And no, the pattern, when you look inside, when you run the transcriptomes and the proteomes of these cell, these human cells, that the, the senescence is, is more directly related to the activity of the bacteria and not the inflammatory environment that they're in. Now, there's no question the inflammatory environment has an impact, no question about that. But what we're saying is, is for the biofilm to be successful, it has to cause these things, and it does have the molecular tools to do these things. So we think the primary mode of senescence or why wound bed cells don't have, show the, the right host healing parameters and everything else is directly dictated by the biofilm itself. You got to have an animal model. So I threw this in. Uh, this isn't really at the molecular level, but it's very important and it will drive one point home. So uh, this comes out of Northwestern. This is Galliano and Musto. And basically they, they have a, a rabbit model where it's an impaired uh, rabbit. Uh, that will grow biofilm. They'll seed all the different uh, uh, sites that they, they take a biopsy or that they wound, uh, or they can leave one open as a control. Uh, and so now you can, uh, you can test treating agents uh, across the time period. What, Rob, what Dr. Galliano did here was uh, he just showed that if he debrided slough off a wound, slough that you can see, that it would reform quite quickly. That slough that they pulled off was mainly human proteins, mainly plasma proteins. There was also bacteria and there were also sugars, which they couldn't characterize, but you know, the sugars are probably not glycosaminoglycans, they're probably the, the matrix material that we're talking about. So when you look at that, when you run a control biopsy versus a one that is has biofilm, you get a p-value of point 0, 0, 0, 0.0001, that means that there's very low probability that this impaired healing that we see with biofilm on the surface of the wound 
is due to anything other than mechanisms of the biofilm itself because the control goes on to heal just, just fine. So biofilm does impair healing in an animal model. They didn't work out exactly how that could be. So here's Kim's work, Kim uh, from Tokyo, uh, uh, Ashido and, and the rest of his group. And basically what they did was they reviewed the literature, 300 different molecular articles of, of what's happening inside the cell with these bacteria. Now these are gut epithelial cells, but you know this translates. Uh, and basically what they found was in a third of the experiments, based on the conditions, the bacteria would penetrate the cell, breach the cell, their words, uh, they would uh, secrete virulence factors, kill the cell, cause necrosis, cause apoptosis, and that was what most people expected. And that's what the scientists thought was a, an infection. And then in two thirds of the articles that they reviewed, that didn't happen. The bacteria would cause uh, cytoskeleton reorganization. It would block mitosis. It would block apoptotic pathways. It would upregulate uh, SOS or survival pathways. And so what Kim and his group called that in their abstract was, this is a new way, that, a new paradigm of bacterial pathogenesis. So what we're saying is, is basically, this is a new way bacteria infect. Well, we just showed you back in 99, <coughs> uh, Costerton was showing that, that biofilm was a different kind of bacterial infection over acute infections. But here, side by side in this one panel on the left, you see that is an acute or planktonic behavior that it would correlate with an acute infection, and this would correlate with a chronic infection and all the molecular uh, data that we, we get from chronic infections. So in just one panel, they're showing the difference between acute and chronic, which is you know pretty cool. So let me divide that up a little bit, say it one more time, because it'll be my major point if you get nothing else out of this lecture, and I really appreciate everybody's time. Uh, it's this, planktonic bacteria, as you see here, tend to cause acute infections and they'll grow in a traditional culture. This, this stuff grows in culture media if it's the right culture media in the right condition. So, you know, 90% of the time, 95% of the, excuse me, 5% of the time, 10% of the time, most of our common bugs will, will grow. Anaerobes, not so much, uh, and fastidia, you know, the mycobacteriums, the things that take too long. The, the clinical culture isn't geared towards those bacteria, and we find a lot of them in the wood. So, but at least culture has a chance there. Biofilm phenotype bacteria do not, they're viable but not culturable. That's if you Google that, you'll find tons of articles on that. They cause 80% of the infections in humans right now, and that was from an NIH meeting. Uh, it, it, they are the cause of chronic wounds, and that comes out of that uh, European infectious disease uh, the, the mon uh, guidelines that we talked about. Uh, they will not grow in traditional cultures, and biofilms are radically different uh, phenotypically from planktonic bacteria, so they behave differently when we try to put them in clinical culture conditions. So just know that planktonic bacteria associated with acute infections, and they, they you can culture will will let you down a lot, but not near as much as biofilm. And in chronic infections, polymicrobial situation cultures are wholly inadequate for diagnosing those, and that's why we're going to go into a different paradigm or, or a different tact here. Most of wound care is done trial and error. Uh, the nurses back in 2004 and five, when they would walk in the room and we were teaching them wound care, uh, they would ask me, well, why did you put that on there? And why are you switching to this? And the, and the, the quick answer is, is, I don't know. I tried uh, iodine, uh, iodazorb, and now I'm switching to hydrofarablue because the iodazorb didn't work. Okay, it's so trial and error. And, and you know, you tried to guess by the smell or the this or the that. But the one thing that, uh, that wound care physicians quickly realize is the cultures don't matter. Uh, the, there's several RCTs that show that if you get a clinical culture and you treat what the clinical culture shows, you, you don't get any better outcomes. So now what we're, what we're saying is, is we need a different tool to diagnose. So let's look at the diagnostic tools that are available. Koch uh, came up with uh, the, the idea of a pure culture. And basically what his, his paradigm back in 1860, over a hundred years ago, 
150 years ago, is that uh, that one bacteria causes an infection. Well, we know that's not true. In chronic infections, they're polymicrobial. Now, they're less diverse. As you, as you get into a lung like cystic fibrosis, there's less diversity than a wound. Uh, when you get to uh, menin chronic meningitis or chronic prostatitis, th there's less diversity than, than uh, the lungs. But at the end of the day, uh, biofilms, uh, they, they like diversity. They're more successful if they're more diverse, and that's been proven in lots of different uh, chronic infections. So his genius lay in his ability to, to bring order out of chaos, but his way he brought order was he just neglected all this different bacteria, and guess what? We're not very good at managing chronic infections. It set us back for over 100 years because of that one premise that we laid down it, that it had to be one organism. So if you can broaden your perspective of, of human uh, infectious disease to, to include polymicrobial infections, infections where there's synergies between the bacteria, where there's community behavior, wow, that opens up a lot of possibilities. So pure culture, here's the limitations of pure culture. You get 24 hours, you, you played out your initial sample, you get 24 hours, and then the, clinician, the technician goes in and he's gonna pick a colony. So we put this plate up here uh, to show you that, that in this one plate, these are lots of different morphologies of the colony. And guess what? The technician really quickly learns it's what, what staff looks like. He quickly learns, she quickly learns what the pseudomonas looks like. And guess what? When they have two or three or four different colony morphologies to pick from, they're going to pick, quote, the pathogen, close quote. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's the pathogen because that's the one you pick. And that's a huge bias in pure cultures. The other thing is, is there's planktonic concepts in, in cultures. This is the 10 to the fifth log, logarithmic growth phase, dropping a disc to see what about antibiotic resistance. Those things don't hold up uh, in, in, a, in a biofilm model. And then the, the biggest uh, problem with pure culture is when you subplate this, the next plate, you're going to bring this one colony across. Well, it's still polymicrobial. But what they found was if you grow it on this thick liquid co called auger, well, very quickly, the, the, the things that grow best will outcompete any other, quote, contaminants, unquote, that are in, the, in that sample that, or in that uh, colony you, you moved over. And so the, the planktonic growing behavior causes competition and survival of the fittest. And so the thing that grows best is what gets reported out to you. So you can see that the, the, the takes, polymicrobial infections can never adequately be diagnosed by pure culture. Here's the other thing is there's a reality to culturing. When you do swabs, you're getting the top bacteria, not the bacteria by the, by the surface of the wound. The other thing is, is it's not handled the way the American Society of Microbiology says it should be handled. You know, that when you transport it, this was stuff that was laid out in the late afternoon in the hot sun where it gets to 100 degrees in Lubbock, Texas. And who knows how long it's out there. So there's a high probability of error from, from the very start just because of the practicalities of getting it to the lab and getting it going. Now, PCR isn't without bias. And I understand that we're going to have a lot of molecular people on here. So I'm not really, you know, I'm a clinician. So anything that I t tell you about PCR and sequencing, uh, you know, you guys are, most of y'all are better at that than I am. So I'm just going to go some basic concepts on this. So the problem, the PCR is very accurate. It gets us down to low copy numbers. So if there's very few of an organism there, we can, we can say plus minus, is it there? And it can be absolutely uh, 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 quantitative in an absolute sense if you run standards on, your, on that same plate of 100 organisms and 1,000 and, and 10,000. Now, getting those standards are, are difficult, but if you have them, uh, you can you know get fairly close to the absolute number of copies of of that specific bug uh, that 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 you're looking for. The the downside of, of PCR is there are primer biases, and the the biggest thing is is you have to have a specific primer that doesn't cross react with anything else 
uh, for each organism that you want to identify. Well, we've already identified over 2,000 microbes in wounds. And, the, and from the previous stuff we said, we can't say what's the pathogen and what's not the pathogen, what synergies matter and what don't at this time. So, you know, you can't get there with PCR. PCR is really good for very quickly, you know, half-day turnaround. That tells me if there's MRSA, if there's Pseudomonas, if there's uh, certain antibiotic resistance genes. And so, you know, I, I can look to 16 things really quick and say, okay, all my resist, all my major things that, that I need to know about are, are not there. Basically, hopefully excluding them. Or if they are there, I can start treating immediately my MRSA or my, my Pseudomonas or whatever. So that's that's the power of PCR. It can tell us the bacterial load in an absolute sense, how much bacteria is there, and it can rule out all the all the big time uh, common pathogens that we'll sometimes see in wounds. Uh, sequencing, there's multiple platforms now. The PIRA sequencing is kind of being phased out. Uh, the 454 uh, people have moved to uh, the P8, the, the the ion torrent, proton torrent, or the MySeq, HiSeq, PAC BIOS coming. So the platforms are changing, and they all have different technologies. And I'm not going to go into those because I don't know them well enough. But all of them put out a, a the a, the the base sequence. Of, of what you're looking at. Now, everybody's looked at 16S up to this time. It's a good uh, fingerprint gene to tell you what uh, species and even sometimes what strain of bacteria you're looking at if you get enough reads or long enough reads. Uh, but uh, but now, with the, with the advent of the, the cheaper sequencing methods, it, it, it's evolving more toward, back to metagenomics uh, because it's cheaper, it's almost as fast, and it can give you information down to the strain level, but it also gives you the resistance factors and the virulence factors that are there, so it's, it's much more complete. My thing is that sequencing far outpaces it is far more comprehensive than culturing, so it, it, it's ready for prime time. So a 16S analysis, 100 bucks, tells you all your fungus, all your bacteria, most of your archaea. Uh, you know, that is, that's really quality, and it tells you relative abundance, so it tells you your major, minor, and uh, uh, constituents of, the, of what you're treating. So sequencing offers a lot. So DNA sequencing, uh, I'm going to go real quick over this, finds all the microbial DNAs there, compares it to known sequences within a database, and it tells you who's there and a relative abundance of, of which microbe is there. So that's our hope for change. Can we change from the archaic uh, culture, 150-year-old uh, mechanism, and go to the more computerized, uh, computer-based uh, uh, methods? That's hard for clinicians. I, I didn't realize it would be so hard because, and the biggest impediment is you get a lot of information, but I think we can help you sort that out. Here's why it becomes important. Dan Rhodes did a, a guy in our office, he's a, a molecular pathologist now, uh, not too many in the country, but Dan uh, did a, 50 consecutive patients that came into the office. And if you compare, if you use culture as the gold standard, we, the, the university laboratory was able to identify 92 different uh, bacteria in those 50 patients. However, over 50% of the time, what they identified were things that weren't in the original culture or were less than 1% of the original culture or 17% of the time what was between 1% and 10%. So basically, anything that was 10% or less, you would expect the culture not to find, but yet over Again, 53% of the time, that's what the culture reported. So it was amplifying minor things, and that, that blew me away. I really thought that a culture would go in, and if it was 80% pseudomonas, it would show me pseudomonas. I, I just thought it would, but we had multiple cultures where there was a dominant organism, 80 90%, and here it was reporting out Staph aureus, which was there at 1%. So that, that was an eye-opener for me. But the biggest reason to, to switch to molecular is if 
you can consider molecular as a gold standard, not counting anaerobic bacteria because we couldn't do anaerobic cultures. We found 552 different species. We doubled the, the these are dominant important species in the uh, dark, dark color down here. And it's double what uh, the culture found. So basically, uh, the, what the take home message there is, is cultures are only showing you about 20% of the microorganisms that are present uh, in a chronic wound. And that's why they are so, in, that's why clinically cultures have not helped us in healing chronic wounds. Uh, I just wanted to throw this up here real quick. We submitted this uh, last month, just a couple of weeks ago, to uh, wound repair and regeneration. And basically, this helps us empirically. We looked at about 3,000 wounds, 2,963. And what we found was 63% of the time there was a staph species. Uh, there were, and the red number is, is the number of species. There's about uh, 20 different uh, staph species. A quarter of all staph was staph aureus, which means 75% was coagulative staph. Again, when you're in a permissive environment of the wound, there are no commensal mechanisms. So those coagulative staphs were truly pathogens. They were acting as pathogens. They were propagating and causing harm. Corny bacterium was in 36% of our wounds uh, and a number of different species. But again, a commensal traditionally, but in a non-commensal environment, it, we have to take it into account when we're doing our empirical therapy. Uh, Pseudomonas came in at about 25% uh, of wounds, so in about a quarter of wounds. But when it was present, they had much more uh, uh, representation. So its relative abundance was actually greater than most staff. So even though it's in a third, the, the, or well, close to a third the number of wounds, it has a higher relative abundance value than, than staph. And then you see that it quickly drops off to 12%. By the time we're down here to Prevotella, you know, it, it, one in 10 have that. So basically the, the point here is wounds are highly, highly polymicrobial. You can expect some sort of staph in wounds, but only about 20 to 30 percent of the time is it the main thing. You're going to see lots of commensals like Propionobacterium and Cronibacterium and stuff. And then the biggest thing that I wanted to show you here was that in the top 10, four of these are anaerobes. So Anaerobes are, are huge. Uh, they're, they're way underreported, way underappreciated uh, in chronic wounds. And so that, when you're dealing with your, your empiric treatment of chronic wounds, you have to consider uh, anaerobic coverage. All right, so now we're going to get to treatment. We've got about 10 minutes to get through the rest of this, so uh, bear with me. When you go to wound care conferences, what they do is they way overthink how to manage a wound, okay? They try to use their head and really they should use the brush uh, to, to manage their biofilm. When you treat your toilet, when you treat your teeth, your tub, your, your countertop, uh, you are managing biofilm, and what you know more than anything else is you debride. And the, when you, the nurse that taught me my wound care, she said the slough, the yellow stuff that's on the surface of the wound, that's like a bunny in the garden. You take that off, it's going to come right back. You saw in Galliano's slide, it, it, you, it comes back within 24 hours. So my point is, is that slough is not a bunny in the garden. That is a chronic infection on the surface of the wound, and it changes its texture, and it changes its quality. It changes exudate and tenderness based on how well you suppress the, the bowel film that's present, that's producing that inflammation, producing that exudate, and, and incorporating that, that uh, plasma protein in its bowel film matrix. We uh, looked at... Uh, uh, the this biofilm matrix to say, you know, if, if we can't take it off, if it's just going to come right back, you know, how do we manage that? Well, how are we ever going to defeat wound biofilm? So we went to CBE and what we found was that this, uh, that if you destroy, disrupt a, a Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm, that within 24 hours, it's antibiotic tolerance uh, redevelops. If we do the same thing in a pig explant bottle, it takes about three to four days for that window to close, for, for that biofilm to reestablish itself on that 
uh, piece of uh, pig skin that we use. If you use a burned mouse model in a live mouse, it takes about four days for the biofilm to become tolerant of, of bleach and, and uh, genomycin. And then if we look at a human, we find the same thing. At day two, one of the patients uh, had closed the window, the biofilm had reformed and it was tolerant to antibiotics. But by three days, all three patients that had a pseudomonas biofilm, uh, the window had closed. So basically what we found is when you disrupt that yellowish slough on the surface of the wound, when it's forced to reconstitute itself, it's sensitive to treating agents. And that's about a three to four day window. This is a patient sent to us by a uh, plastic surgeon and she said, look, uh, this patient will do a donor site for a skin graft. This is ready for a skin graft. But I think if, you know, and she said the edges are healing and they are, they're feathering in and, and the, the, the colors generally yellow are generally red, but you do see uh, patches of yellow. And basically we were able to pull a film a, an intact film of plasma with embedded bacteria off the surface in this wound. And so the management of the surface is critical and you got to have frequent debridement. The other the question I get is what about necrotic tissue? What about dead tissue that's on the surface of the wound? This is pyoderma. Uh, so there's deep necrosis in this, but when we, when we biopsy these areas of necrosis, yeah, there's tissue in there, but there's organized biofilm structures. And then after we debride frequently and we do our biofilm-based wound care, we can get to what we're after. And this is, this is the same leg about six months later, and you see the bumpy texture, and that's the granular nature. The reason I show this slide is so many people talk to me about necrotic granulation tissue. I, I've gotten so many referrals and I'm saying, if something's necrotic, it's not, gra it's not granulation tissue. Granulation tissue needs to look like this, with those bumps, with that color. When it looks like this, it's, it's not granulating, it, it's something else. Uh, so let me talk about my general principles of biofilm-based wound care real quickly. Uh, and knowing that, that, you know, this is a work in progress and some of the things that I'm going to tell you, we may not believe two or three years from now, but right now this works and it works really good, so we'll talk about it. So biofilm-based wound care is doing multiple concurrent dynamic strategies and basically the FDA hates this, okay? So when we talk about treatment strategies and systems for chronic wounds, What's mandated by regulatory agencies is, is that you try one thing so you can prove if it worked or not, if it had the efficacy, and then you try the next thing, and then you try the next thing. And that sequential stuff doesn't work for biofilm because it has multiple species of bacteria that can reorganize around any of its members. So if you knock out 20% of its members, it reorganizes and, and, and reestablishes itself with, without that contingent. So uh, you have to do multiple different things at the same time, and then you have to change when the biofilm change. This is a, a gauze that's uh, sewn on to a, um, a chronic, uh, an opening that's, that's made in the mouse. And if you don't put something like this on it, uh, it'll heal up in two to three days. But if you put this gauze on there, it will last for months. And when I saw that, I said, well, it's not the gauze that's keeping that open. It's this slime that's keeping it open. So my point on this is we choose dressings that don't have, that don't uh, allow a bowel film to uh, attach to it and to form it within it because it's gonna seed all those, all those diffusible molecules back on the wound and keep it from healing. So it's, it's biofilm that causes that. So the multiple strategies we use is number one, debridement. That's what we talked about. Use the brush. That's what you do on your teeth twice a day, and you're going to do that for the rest of your life. So don't get, don't get tired of, of being aggressive with debridement. Use selective biocides, and, and that's silver, iodine, methyl, and blue. By selective, but I mean it, it kills the bacteria, but it doesn't kill host cells. We use anti-biofilm dressings. We don't want biofilm to, to form on our dressings and, and seed material back onto the wound. And we use antibiotics. We don't shy away from them. We use them personalized and we use them long and strong. But the way to use strong antibiotics is to apply them topically. So once we get our diagnostic back, we formulate a specific individualized gel for the, the, the microbes that are on the wound 
and we apply that and usually one one gel will follow that wound until its completion usually uh, something else doesn't emerge but occasionally it does and so we end up uh, changing the the uh, reculturing and changing the gel about 1.3 times uh, in, a, in that 3,000 wound group that we talked about. So that's biofilm-based wound care. Let's talk about how it works. This is Alan. Uh, Alan showed up. He's a concrete worker. He's about 40 years old. He showed up at the ER with a foot full of pus. And so they took him to the operating room and the uh, surgeon found that he had osteomyelitis. They woke him up in the recovery room and said, hey, Alan, which is not his name, hey, look, you're going to you're gonna need a major limb amputation. We're going to have to cut your leg off below the knee. Well, he used construction language, concrete worker language on the surgeon and said, no, I don't think so. So he left AMA. He got back to the room, but he left AMA that day uh, and came over to our wound on 7-29-09. Uh, on 7-30-09, I might mention, uh, that uh, surgeon called me and he'd already learned that uh, construction language. And he told me in, in construction language that Alan's death was on my head. And I said, you know, uh, you know, and I, I knew him personally, and I said, no, it's not going to happen. Because, see, we know about biofilm. We know what causes that yellow slough. We know what causes that, that necrotic t uh, tissue. We're going to diagnose it. We're going to treat it with multiple concurrent strategies. We're going to change when we need to. And, and this is going to heal, okay? And so he didn't believe me. But a month later, it looks a lot better. Uh, Two months later, eight weeks later, we said it was healed enough that he could go back to work, and 12 weeks later, we let him go back to work. I have a bunch of these, you know, and, and it should not surprise, you know, it's really cool when you see it, but it shouldn't surprise us as wound care providers if we're saying that, that the senescence, the slow healing that, that we see in a chronic wound is directly related to the biofilm, by, by resolving that biofilm, we should resolve that barrier and it should heal like an acute wound. So basically, we had a bunch of Allens in this group uh, here. And if you treat with standard of care, the trial and error that we talked about, you heal about 50% of wounds in six months. If you go to the molecular diagnostics with the customized topical antibiotics, you heal about 90% of wounds in six months. And that makes sense because, you know, uh, if biofilm is an important barrier, then suppressing that should allow that healing to take place. All right, so that's the biofilm surprise. There's two ways that bacteria infect. So if you'll take that home, planktonic bacteria cause acute infections. Uh, biofilm phenotype bacteria cause chronic infections. We have the ability to diagnose and to treat personalized, specifically the wound. But if you take this away, Biofilm is why chronic wounds behave chronically, the, the duration, the non-healing, the exudate, etc. So that's the biofilm surprise. It is an important barrier. It's a bunny. It's not a bunny in the garden. It's like a bunny we've never, ever met before. And thank you for your time. So now we'll open it up to questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Wolcott, for that very informative presentation. It's Q&A time now, and if uh, any of you have any questions you'd like to ask Dr. Wolcott, please submit them now. You can do so by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your question or comment and clicking on send. Let's wait a little while to see if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question. If there are no questions, I'd like to once again thank Dr. Wolcott. And Dr. Wolcott, are there any closing statements you'd like to make before we end the broadcast? Well, again, I, I didn't get feedback from the individual faces, but I hope this clicked and I hope people will take this on as, as research and as, as an area of interest for them. If they, uh, if, uh, they want to see this again or if they want any more material they can uh, email me and I think that's on the presentation material someplace. Uh, I do respond to emails and uh, again we want to catalyze any research, any interest that we can in any field uh, that people would have an interest in biofilm. And I'll turn it back over to you Bob. 
Well, thanks again, Dr. Wilcott, and special thanks to our audience for joining us. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Roche Diagnostics, for making this presentation possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2016. LabRoots will send you an email alerting to you when it's available on demand, and uh, that will also be posted on LabRoots.com. You are welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join the presentation today. Thanks again for joining us and participating in today's broadcast. Until next time, thanks and see you later.